All right. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Uh, welcome to today's CNCF webinars. Uh, best practices for deploying a service mesh in production from technology to teams. Uh, my name is Ariel Jatib. I'm a business development manager for cloud native technologies at NetApp, the CNCF ambassador. I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar, around, uh, which will be a conversation uh, between William Morgan, co founder and CEO of Point, uh, Anna Kalin, systems engineer at Paypace, William King, uh, CTO and founder at Subspace, and Matt Young. VP of Cloud Engineering, uh, or VP of Cloud Engineering at Evercore. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There's a QA box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get there. Uh, we'll get to the, as many of those as we can at the end. Uh, please remember this is an official CN, uh, webinar at the CNCF and is such subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code. Uh, basically, be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Um, please note uh, that this recording and the slides will be available later today on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io forward slash webinars. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to William. Thanks, Ariel. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I promise we're gonna try and make this exciting and fun, and we're not gonna talk about the pandemic for 60 minutes. You'll have a safe zone. All right, so uh, the title of the webinar is Service Mesh from Technology to Teams. Uh, this is me, I'm William Morgan, um, one of the creators of Linkerd, which is a service mesh. I'm the CEO of a company called Buoyant, which does lots of service mesh things, including uh, sponsoring and maintaining Linkerd. Uh, I build a project called Dive, which is a delivery platform for service meshes. I have deli uh, delivered many uh, service mesh talks, and webinars, and basically my entire life began with the service mesh and will end with the service mesh fading into obscurity. Well, hopefully not. Um, so that's me. Um, the actually interesting people here today. So what I want to do is I'm going to have each of these folks introduce themselves. And the majority of this um, uh, presentation is going to be a conversation uh, with them. Um, so uh, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, what Everquote does, and what your role there is? Uh, certainly. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I run uh, our cloud engineering team at Everquote. Uh, Everquote operates a leading online insurance marketplace uh, in the United States that connects consumers that are uh, seeking insurances of various types with insurance providers uh, to help them protect life's most important assets, um, their family, property, and future. Uh, in short, uh, we connect a whole lot of people that want to uh, shop for something with a whole bunch of people that are providing uh, services. And we do a bunch of machine learning, uh, and smart analytics uh, combined with a fairly sizable um, uh, web facing um, set of services uh, to make that happen. Uh, my team uh, partners with our engineering teams. Um, they're my customers uh, and, and we build a platform um, full of services and curated patterns that let our teams manage their own services in production. Great, thanks, Anna. Hi everyone, my name is Anna. I'm a systems engineer or infrastructure engineer at Paybase. Um, and Paybase is a payment services provider, specifically for market bases, gig sharing economies, uh, blockchain businesses, or any type of fintechs. Uh, we are um, a fintech ourselves, um, and we operate in a very regulated space, which means that for us specifically, it's very important to be highly reliable, available, and scalable to support our customers. Great. And William. Hey, folks. William King, uh, CTO co-founder of Subspace. It's a two-year-old startup that we just came out of stealth like in the last couple of weeks ago. Um, we are solving lag for multiplayer gamers globally. Uh, everything from layer one with lasers all the way up to uh, the highest layers with uh, distributed systems. Awesome. Well, thank 
uh, thank all three of you for joining us today. Um, we're going to post the slides um, on the CNCF website, but I'll just point out, I'm going to skip ahead to the very, very end. I have um, a couple links in here. Um, our esteemed panelists didn't mention, you know, some really exciting stuff. So I have a link to Subspace's big uh, launch uh, or emergence from stealth announcement. Uh, Matt has an upcoming service mesh talk uh, on at service mesh con and then Anna actually delivered a talk at the last service mesh. con. All right, with that, uh, let's take a look at the agenda for today. So um, I want to try and keep this pretty simple and the main thing that I want to do is there is a lot of technical content out there around the service mesh. I don't want to cover that too much, mostly what I want to focus on and the reason why I've asked uh, Anna and William and, and Matt to join us is kind of the organizational aspect. So once you actually have a service mesh that you have deployed to some environment somewhere, how do engineers interact with it? What has to change or doesn't have to change around the way that uh, the teams are structured and basically how do you actually operate this thing from kind of the, the team and human perspective as opposed to from the perspective of you know the, the computers and, and the bits and bytes. So that's the focus of the webinar. Um, I'm going to start with a very brief look at what is a service mesh just so that we're all on the same page uh, and then the majority of this uh, time will be on a fun and exciting panel with our three guests and then we'll have some time at the end for um, Q&A's from the audience. So as Ariel said feel free to Type in your questions uh, as you hear interesting things, and then uh, we'll do our best to address them in the tail section of the webinar. Okay, so with that, uh, what is the service mesh? I promise I'm going to keep this brief. Uh, and actually, I'm going to take a different, slightly different focus. So here's here's uh, what I'd like to uh, frame it as this time: is a service mesh is a tool, and it's a tool for giving the platform owners. Um, you know, as opposed to the developers or the business logic implementers. It's a tool for giving them the observability, the reliability and security primitives, right? This is like kind of the stuff that you get. Those primitives are critical for cloud native architectures, which is why we, we want to give them uh, to them. Um, and we do it, the kind of the magic beans is we do it with no developer involvement. Ideally, okay, there's some asterisks in there, right? Ideally, what the service mesh delivered and the reason why it's so useful is not actually the features themselves, but it's the fact that it delivers those features to the platform team in a way that decouples them from the developer teams. So rather than asking the developer teams to all implement TLS in the exact same way, you know, and fighting with the product managers who are trying to deliver, you know, kind of business logic features, we can do that at the platform level rather than having instrumentation be fragmented across all and, and telemetry fragmented across every service, or well, we can give you a consistent layer of telemetry uh, at the platform level and so on. So that is what a service mesh is. In practice, they all follow a similar pattern and I'm gonna mostly talk about Linkerd here because that's the one that I'm most familiar with, but the reality is mo almost every service mesh follows a very similar pattern, which is you have a control plane, you have a data plane, and the control plane has, you know, kind of some machinery around how the service mesh actually works um, and keeping things together. And the data plane is where we do this kind of the, the weird and funny thing, which is we install a little proxy next to every, in, in Kubernetes terms, inside every pod. And we wire the traffic through that proxy. And those little proxies, which you now have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of, right, those are kind of uh, what we call the data plane. And, and those are responsible for managing, manipulating, and measuring all the traffic that goes in between your applications. So there's lots more information about this on linkerd.io. Um, it's an open source, open governance service mesh. It's a CNCF project, very happy about that. It's been in production for, for um, probably much longer than this, including at companies like uh, uh, Paybase and Evercote and, and Subspace, all sorts of GitHub stars, which is very uh, important and um, eight week, uh, more or less stable release cadence. Okay, very last section here. So just to make this really concrete, you know, what does Linkerd actually do? There's a set of features around observability. There's a set of features around reliability and there's a set of features around security. And as we have our conversation with our panelists, uh, well, you know, a lot of these features are, are, are gonna be brought to the surface. Um, and so on the observability side, we have things like service level golden metrics. So success rates, latencies, throughput, service topologies. On the retry side or on the reliability side, we have things like retries and timeouts and load balancing, multi-cluster support 
on the security side, we have things like transparent mutual TLS and certificate management. And the angle that Linkerd provides in this space is uh, try to be as, as light um, and as simple as possible. So it's easy to make things complicated. It's a lot more difficult to make them simple. Um, so that's what we spend a lot of our time and, and energy. And uh, I guess we'll find out whether we did a good job at that or not <laughs> very soon. Okay, so now on to the fun part. Hopefully, hopefully that all made sense. Um, if, it, if it didn't, uh, in that resources slide at the very, very end, um, of the slide deck or a, a couple links to some uh, uh, docs and, and blog posts and things that you can read um, to, to help you inform your thinking about the service mesh as a category. Okay, so now the, the, the kind of fun part here. Is, um, so this is a question, you know, that I really want to address, which is how does my engineering organization successfully adopt a service mesh? And what I'm going to do is our three victims, I mean participants, I'm gonna ask them a series, a series of questions. We're gonna do it panel style. Um, and um, uh, hopefully we will all learn something new because all three of these people have actually deployed a service mesh to production and have to live with the consequences of that decision every day. Okay, so this is, a, this is the big list of questions, but we're actually gonna go through this one by one. Everybody feeling ready? Yes. All right. Okay, so the very first question, which of course I missed. <laughs> uh, how big is your engineering organization and how is it structured? Uh, Matt, why don't we start with you? Uh, sure. Uh, our engineering organization at Everquote is uh, roughly around 100 people all in uh, across disciplines. Um, my immediate team uh, is seven or eight. Uh, I'm overhead, so I'll say seven, um, uh, but we're growing. Um, the way we're structured uh, is something that we've pivoted over the last year. Uh, you know, in the past, the team was um, largely operationally based where we were, you know, sort of um, just doing what was needed. Uh, but over the last year, we've really changed out to uh, more of a forward looking team, uh, you know, tasked with building out um, a platform uh, that allows us to solve problems for our engineering team so that they don't have to solve them uh, individually. So in a way, we're an embedded startup inside a recently public company. My customers are all of the engineering teams uh, and my product is all the cloud things. Uh, so they're, they're a service hosting environment. Great, Anna, how do things look at Paybase? Um, so for us, our engineering team is unusually small. We have a total of five people that includes two systems engineers so like infrastructure engineers or sre and two uh, three software engineers um, and the way the team is split the way the work looks like is that although the systems engineer maintain the infrastructure and monitoring systems and service mesh um, our software engineers are able to to deploy uh, new versions of an application themselves without having to make uh, major changes to infrastructure and uh, everyone gets involved into everything so we can also the systems engineers can also troubleshoot the application side um, and the other way around um, so we have quite a flat structure in a way um, type of team great great and William how does subspace look uh, Subspace has about 30 engineers from infrastructure engineers to connectivity and network engineers all the way through to performance and software engineering. Uh, we're about 10 people on the software engineering and SRE side uh, and the service mesh is kind of owned by that software engineering group. Okay, great. So we've got a nice uh, range of sizes here. We've got 5, 30, and 100 engineers. All right, and the next question, uh, William, I think you got a head start on this already, so why don't you, um, why don't you keep going with it? So yeah, at Subspace, who owns the service mesh and how does the rest of the organization interact with them? Sounds good. <clears throat> so SREs and the software engineers all, that's so you take the lead on it, uh, developing what our pipelines look like uh, for the different service meshes that we've got deployed. And a lot of the other software engineers interact with it by taking some of the service templates and toolkits 
that we do from kind of our skeleton uh, best practices. Um, we, we kind of take the approach of the service mesh and the tooling is kind of the paved highway. And <clears throat> if the software engineers need to go off-roading, they can do everything custom. But most look at it and say the tooling that you need that the service mesh provides isn't worth it. So they take the templates, get the service deployed, oftentimes in under an hour. So. Great. Anna, how about you? Um, so if uh, by own you mean who configures my exchanges, upgrades the service mesh, that would be myself and the other systems engineer in our team. Um, however, I want to add that our setup is such that after we've deployed it to production, um, every time we add a new, a new service into our system, um, everything is um, automatically configured to join the service mesh. So um, the actual management of it, it's um, very small. It's, um, yeah, it's very minimal. Matt, is that your experience as well? Um, <clears throat> ownership. So we, we, from a, from a, if it breaks, who fixes it, that would be our team. Uh, if it's ownership in terms of who's been a proponent for it and who's rolled it out, that's also my team. Um, however, um, I think at least at, at Everquote, uh, our applications increasingly are viewing the infrastructure that they need as inclusive to their definition of what their service is. Uh, whether that's core infrastructure components like storage buckets and things like that, you know, now we have Terraform and whatnot uh, descriptions uh, alongside the service. Uh, the same is true for um, some of the configuration uh, of the mesh. Uh, we're, we don't have, you know, we have roughly a, a quarter of our services, the most critical ones um, in, in the mesh now with, you know, adoption happening over the coming, uh, I'd say, quarter and a half. Uh, so initially i would say it's a, it's a it's more of a shared ownership model however because the way we prioritized how we're how we're structuring this was done in close collaboration with the teams that needed it right so we really leveraged them to to, to make sure that we weren't off in space so to speak from a requirement standpoint but you know in a classical definition we we, we own it i suppose yeah i left that i left that word ambiguous to see <laughs> see what people would say. Um, what about for things like, uh, you know, uh, the retry policy for a particular service or, you know, uh, timeout configuration or things like there are these intersection points between the platform side and the developer side. Uh, there, there are, I, I could talk more to it um, in, in the, in the, in the, why did we adopt the mesh and how do we, how do we roll it out? But, um, <clears throat> you know, we have a, Everquote's about five or six years old, seven, depending on how you count. Uh, so there's, uh, I don't say strata, but there's a number of different uh, epics, <laughs> time periods, uh, and different service architectures. And the most recent few years is primarily Kubernetes hosted for new services. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, before we had a service mesh, we needed to deal with timeouts and retries. So we actually have some services and or libraries that are in use that do some of that. So some of the features uh, that a mesh provides that you mentioned uh, for many services, it, it's a way for them to prune out things, but we haven't done that yet. Um, yeah. I can speak more to uh, maybe the, next, the following question uh, and let the others speak, uh, but it, it would be a little more, a little more clear. William or Anna, do you have developers who are trying to, or who, uh, who have things like retry policies or latency uh, or, or timeouts or things that they care about that they then have to, you know, there's some kind of interaction between dev and, and platform. Um, sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, so it's more, you know, uh, sometimes there are things that developers, depending on the organization, there are things that developers may care about that kind of fall into the service mesh uh, realm of functionality, right? Like. I care about how retries are going to work for my for my service, or I care about how, you know, the timeouts that callers are setting when they call my service. Um, yeah, they do indeed care about latency uh, and retries, but um, we haven't seen after we've implemented Linkerd, we haven't seen um, a big change or like a latency increase 
mm -hmm. uh, that affected the performance of our system. In fact, we were able to make other changes at the same time that um, enabled us to, to be able to offer the same kind of performance uh, for the system. Great, so LinkedIn solves it for you. <laughs> yeah. I'll say on our side, we're very latency aware and we measure everything in milliseconds or smaller. Um, we actually use uh, Linkerd to help. A service is able to uh, insist that its uh, clients and its consumers um, are not setting timeouts longer than a certain amount or other retry benefits. Uh, a, a consumer is able to be more aggressive and have a lower threshold, but a service is able to say what its expectations are. It's basically using from an SRE, SLO type uh, perspective. We use the service mesh to help standardize that. So those particular thresholds for an individual service, are they, you know, are they in the hands of the platform team or are they in the hands of the developer team? Um, we don't really have much of that distinction here. It's kind of like a co-partnership um, on that, but it's at the service, like the namespace architecture level that will go through and agree that this particular service should have these characteristics and then both sides will implement to that. Okay, great. Okay, so <laughs> I guess we, we covered uh, a lot of this already, but is there a notion of like this formal platform team? And if, if so, you know, what are its stated goals or how does it know whether it's being successful? I think Anna, in your case, let's start with you because uh, um, I think you probably have the easiest answer to this, which is, uh, well, I'll let, I'll, <laughs> I won't speak for you. Well, as I said, our, our team has a very flat structure, but in terms of making sure we're doing well, I guess um, it comes down to measuring the performance of, our, of the system, um, not being paged consistently when we're on call. Um, and we've, we haven't seen an impact ever since we've, uh, we've implemented Linkerd and the right version for us. And, you know, ever after, after we've solved all of the initial bugs we've encountered, um, we haven't seen either way uh, that uh, performance has changed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's the five five engineer perspective. Let's jump up to the 30 engineer perspective. William, back to you. Yeah, so from us, we're just getting to the point where we've got uh, SREs who are driving and doing things like Linkerd upgrades or Kubernetes node uh, scaling uh, out. And it's been great to be able to uh, change the type of node that our entire cluster is using while the cluster is still in a zero downtime state. Um, the goals from the platform team are kind of being able to know is, is our overall platform uh, and the service we're providing to customers and the gamers, is it still operating in a nominal state? If it is, then okay, all of these things that would require large uh, coordination can keep continuing. If not, they're the ones who are able to at least shine a broad uh, flashlight on where the problem might be. That's one of the things that we've really valued out of the observability was it's easy, it's within a minute or so, it's easy to tell roughly where in the service tree the problem is originating from. Okay. And then Matt, what's the, you know, at the hundred person perspective, is, is the cloud engineering org the platform team? Um, I guess there's a couple of different ways to answer that. Uh, Inside Everquote, we actually we, we've we've just uh, finished planning for the quarter and 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 really talking about what what's what's a service versus what's a platform. Um, it has been has been a topic. So so if I'm if I'm to use sort of the definitions that we've adopted internally, you know, we would say as you know, a service is something that delivers value to you. Like here's a thing you can call. Here's a service I'm running you know, um, it provides this value. Whereas a platform is something that you can use to generate value for yourself. I don't know if that distinction is clear. So, it, you know, right now, I think we we have a number of platforms teams. So, you know, within, within this larger for the context of this discussion uh, team, you know, we have a data engineering um, portion of our of our consolidated engineering team and they run a data and analytics platform right that people can put data into our cloud platform that we're running uh, you know com is comprised of you know some shared terraform modules and kubernetes clusters and the service mesh uh, so in that in that respect yes we're a platform team uh, and we're 
producing something that our teams can just come to and use. Uh, I think we're still, um, you know, midway through the full rollout. So, you know, I'll caveat it with saying, you know, we still have some work to do before I would call it like a done platform, which to me means I can back away slowly from it. All of the core use cases are covered and documented with examples. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're still more in the like, well, here are the dozen or so services on it. And if we're going to add a new one, we'll do what they're doing, but it's not completely self-serve yet. So in that respect, uh, it's not a done platform. Um, if that, I don't know if that's a useful distinction or I could just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then William and Anna, if anything that Matt says sounds crazy, you know, feel free to jump in and just yell at him. Of course. Hello. Okay, I'm really not fragile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so Matt, actually, why don't we why don't we stick with you? So, I think you've touched on this a little bit, but what was the original motivation for adopting a service mesh, and, and how's that panned out, or have you like kind of shifted? Sure. Um, so we uh, at Everquote, we were we had the happy misfortune. <laughs> Uh, of having way more load than we expected a little bit sooner than we expected. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen um, traffic to our, our consumer facing services uh, just you know double, triple and, and, and up. Uh, so we had a number of monoliths that were being decomposed um, in, in the process. Um, you know, in some cases we actually have great, uh, you, know, you know, very discrete classically defined microservices. But in other cases, we have what's more really a distributed monolith or somewhere in between. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean we needed to scale some portions more than others, but we still do have either temporal coupling uh, or in some cases, uh, other forms of coupling um, still present, which again, is not necessarily broken. Uh, so uh, our initial motivation for bringing in a service mesh, it was Istio at the time, uh, was to load balance gRPC. Uh, we had grown as an organization to the point where simple REST interfaces, while expedient, uh, became a little more difficult to manage um, without very strict, you know, swagger definitions or open API specs, which didn't always happen. So Proto and gRPC was chosen as an RPC typed language uh, for many of the new services. but. Built, you know, all of the cloud providers didn't at the time have L7 load balancing, and many still don't. So, um, you know, we had lots of load and no way to load balance it. So that was our initial motivation. Uh, there are, however, uh, two other real big reasons why we needed, and we do need uh, still a service mesh. One, some of our teams are breaking into, or not breaking into, we are, <laughs> we're in the health space uh, and we, end up dealing with not just personally identifiable information, PII, but uh, EPHI or other data uh, that our customers give us uh, that's either of a medical nature or, or, or the like, where there are, are compliance issues where we need to ensure that we have MTLS uh, and encryption in transit as well as at rest for everything full stop. So having a service mesh you know, that, that's one of those things that we can provide to all teams without all teams having to deal with authentication and encryption and MTLS. So uh, that was the second big one. And then third, observability, obviously. Um, you know, when we were a 20 person company with a big shared code base, um, everyone just kind of knew what was going on. But now that we have dozens of services and rising uh, and, you know, teams that are growing, not just in number, but also across geographies, where we're now, um, you know, a multi-region team, if you will, um, having a consistent observability platform is, is critical um, for mean time to issue identification, resolution, diagnosis, uh, and the like. Yeah. Okay. So the initial impetus then was purely for gRPC load balancing, but then now the things that have been sticky, I guess, are uh, the mutual TLS and the I'm sorry. Yeah, and there, there's actually a fourth one. I don't want to hog too much time here, but you know, we're rolling out continuous deployment for our services. Uh, we're using Flux CD and Flagger for Kubernetes hosted uh, services, at least. Uh, and the observability and metrics that come out of that can help us form the predicates that we use for canaries. Uh, that's active work in flight for us. We've got, you know, pilots up now and we like what we see so far. Um, 
So we're, we're doing things like uh, this quarter, taking all of our proto that we build in CI and generating service profiles. Um, we've moved over to Linkerd. So now our observability is not just at service level, but it will be moving forward at route level or at method invocation level. Um, and that's a huge win because, you know, um, when something goes wrong or, or, or when we have an issue, we can very quickly see where the issue is. Um, down yeah. To route level. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I love that stuff. It's really, really cool. Uh, and I know you're also in a regulated space. Um, what was your motivation? Was it mutual TLS or was it something? Uh, um, yeah, so the the main motivation was uh, gRPC load balancing as well. Um, our application is a distributed monolith that is deployed on top of Kubernetes as microservices. So it's quite complex and it has, I think last time we counted over 50 microservices, but right now realistically maybe towards 80 if not 100. Um, and we are in a regulated space, so um, MTLS and uh, encryption and security was really important to us, but we are able to, uh, to find other ways to go around that. The main issue was scalability and being able for our services that communicate through gRPC and protobuf, being able to uh, load balance gRPC um, was a pain point. And if we wouldn't have use the service mesh, we would have had to change the way the services communicate with each other or even build our own service mesh. But I don't think that was something that, yeah, too much, too much work. Um, yeah, that's not fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. And then William, you know, unlike Anna and Matt, you get to live this carefree life of no regulations, no rules, you can do whatever you want. I assume. Um, so what was the, the motivation for you folks, especially since you are operating such, you know, in such a low or in a, such a latency sensitive kind of uh, space? Why would you add a service mesh that just adds proxies and adds latency everywhere? So uh, my co-founder and I actually came out of a regulated telecom space. So we brought forward a lot of those best practices and we were like, if we were gonna build in something at the infrastructure level, we might as well start using best practices. It's a lot easier to greenfield, uh, bring those in and establish them as uh, tooling than it is to try and backport them later. Uh, for us, it was actually more uh, to bring in determinism and uh, more services being able to self-configure. So some of the examples, uh, because we're doing clusters between multi-cloud, uh, both from uh, on-prem bare metal to cloud hosted versions, uh, we were seeing strange connectivity issues between them and having the service mesh run MTLS or run basically the connection proxying between the services in the cluster and we were able to get ways to do it between clusters. It actually brought a lot of determinism in and services were able to go through and self-configure how they wanted the service mesh to react. Um, and since we use Scaffold and Helm for a lot of our CI CD deployment process, uh, we were able to specify that in the actual deployment so we could make as a discrete unit a service mesh change. Like for instance, when we, were, uh, we had one scenario for a couple of days, a TCP connection leak, and oops. But we were able to use the service mesh to very specifically tune it from multiple perspectives to find out where the source of that came in and roll it back and then roll forward once we had resolved it. So it's worth the, it's worth the latency hit. Uh, we see bigger latency hits, not from the mesh itself, but from many other sources. Uh, link, uh, having a service mesh has bought the mesh more of a latency budget by solving it elsewhere than its cost. Okay, great. In our experience as well, um, we haven't really noticed any issues um, with latency uh, with Linkerd and, and we've bought Samara budget elsewhere. In particular, the more nuanced way that load balancing happens, that's a, a little more um, adaptive that Linkerd has. Um, you know, in particular, we run some fairly large clusters um, where we opportunistically run some workloads on faster nodes when, you know, model training things uh, aren't, aren't busy. Uh, and so, you know, 
it's not a, a, unif a uniform distribution or a round robin load balancing uh, for, for some of our gRPC services is not super optimal. Yeah, uh, this is really good to hear. One of the challenges we really faced early on in talking about the concept of a service mesh to people was, you know, like it seems like a bad idea, right? <laughs> like you're, you're adding thousands of proxies everywhere and like you're gonna incur a hit there. And so, you know, you have to, you, we, we had to talk about how, you know, yes, every abstraction, you know, has, has a cost, but you're gonna have benefit at the end. And like, it's, but it's, uh, you know, it feels like a very abstract kind of conversation. So knowing that it actually is worth it in, in practice is... Uh... Um, I do remember, William, one of the very first versions of Linkerd, uh, when we installed it, we've seen major, major latency added to our services. But then, but then there was a bug between the application and on Linkerd, but then we've sort of worked and then we solved that. And after that has been fixed, we haven't seen much latency added. Great. Okay. Whew. Well, I'm glad we fixed <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on to the next one. Actually, I think um, there's two questions here and maybe we'll try and address them at the, at the same time because I want to make sure we have space at the end for audience questions. But so, uh, you know, what's been the organ biggest organizational challenge to rolling out a service mission? By organizational, I mean like people, you know, uh, um, I understand that deploying anything in Kubernetes is a challenge just from the you know, kind of the nature of the beast. Um, and then what's been the most surprising benefit? So uh, William, why don't we start with you yep. because you have the best name, biggest organizational challenge and most surprising benefit, if any. Yeah, I would say for us, the biggest organizational challenge was kind of two parts and we solved each of them uh, in an interesting way. So one was being able to find a shared set of configurations that works for all services when we know that's impossible. So we found a working to find the same default and how do we uh, migrate off of that default for specific scenarios for as long as they have to be off default and then where possible try and bring them back in. And so that was managing that uh, was an organizational challenge. Um, more of that related to uh, working with uh, some amazing engineers in our team uh, who were learning how to go from a service mesh. So folks who had never actually been in an SRE or an operations type of role, even we had a, we have a nickname internally, you're the SRE intern for these sets of projects where it's basically you're getting the matrix level download of how does a service mesh work? How do all the components work? How do you change and configure individual components to override the defaults? Um, so organizational challenge, that was uh, a piece. Um, it's paid off dividends for us because we now have more people who understand how the internals of the components work. Uh, the first part with the configurations and the defaults, we had scenarios that I won't get into in too much detail where we intended a configuration on a service mesh deployment to look one way. And in reality, when it deployed in Kubernetes, it looked different. And so when you're trying to make gentle uh, adjustments that direction and you have a deployment system that interprets things uh, unexpectedly, uh, at least un unfortunate downsides. Great, great. And Matt, what about you? You're steering this ginormous organizational boat. What was the biggest uh, organizational challenge and you know, most surprising, shocking benefit? Um, so I think one of the, one of the challenges I think um, wasn't to initially adopt the mesh. I mean, we had very concrete problems of, uh, I'll say manual load balancing happening uh, be before we had a solution to load balance gRPC. So, so you know, I, I guess at a high level, the challenge has been that um, for teams that have an acute concrete need for which a mesh uh, solves, uh, that's easy. Uh, what's a little bit harder in a growing company, uh, and we are, uh, we have an enormous opportunity, uh, uh, you know, and we manage the business such that when we do things that uh, increase um, revenue or or, or are working, uh, we do more of them. Um, and so getting the conversation around for teams that don't have an acute problem, uh, but there's an organization wide benefit to having all of our applications in a mesh where we can in a consistent way uh, have a view 
across services, having them take time to actually learn some of the things they need to learn or um, change configurations and things like that, uh, that doesn't have an immediate value to their team. Uh, that can be just from a people or a project management perspective, a little bit of a challenge. However, I think it's solvable. And when you show them some of the stuff they get like, hey, you can come to the mesh or you can implement MTLS yourself. <laughs> uh, or, you know, um, some of the, some of the, you know, we're standardizing on uh, an observability stack that is going to really heavily leverage consistent metrics coming from these services so that we can say, hey, if you hop on the mesh, here's all this alerting and monitoring uh, and anomaly detection and other things that you'll get out of the box that you would otherwise maybe have to manage yourself. Um, so that's one challenge. Uh, another challenge we've had is, um, you know, we, we shifted to Kubernetes a couple a couple of years ago, and some of the difficulty is there. I mean, as an aside, uh, <laughs> my 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 partner, uh, uh, the first time she saw the peanut butter I was eating a couple of years ago, it was like this raw peanut butter stuff. That's you know, she said, "Oh, this is okay, but it doesn't taste like it's done." To me, Kubernetes doesn't feel like it's done yet, right? It's 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 useful. It's a step in the right direction. It's it's doing a lot of positive things, but it feels like it's not arrived. There is a barrier to entry, uh, and so in particular for us, we have both Kubernetes and non-Kubernetes workloads. So I think one of the challenges has been that teams now need to kind of, in particular, when they have services both inside and outside Kubernetes. Now, it's forced us to address some technical debt and learning around. How do we handle east west versus north south traffic right how do we you know what are the finer points of this um and i think a positive aspect though is that we now have had a, a number of discussions about uh how we're how we're making some choices like we're using nginx now instead of cloud vendor specific ingresses for this kind of use cases um and an outcome has been you know a higher level of perhaps knowledge about the bowels of the networking that was not there before. Um, <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. And, and Anna, you're the real engineer here, right? The rest of us have devolved into management roles and are in our ivory towers, shuffling org, org charts around. So keep us, keep us pure. What's been the biggest uh, organizational challenge at Paybase for rolling out Linkerd? Um, well, benefit? it has been, honestly, it has been uh, dealing with bugs and again I'm not talking necessarily from a from a service mesh perspective or application perspective was to do mo uh, mainly with the complexity of our application and uh, very specific functionality that we were using that it seemed that at the time none of the other Linkerd or even Istio because we've tried Istio before Linkerd uh, users were seeing so for me, I remember a few, quite a few weeks where I would um, deploy it um, onto our testing environment, test it uh, as much as I could. And then I would message my team saying, I'm ready to deploy to production. I would deploy to production. And then I'd have everyone in the team saying, stop, 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 roll back. It's not working. And um, again, the, the talk that um, I did uh, with uh, Risha at uh, Service Mesh Con talks about those challenges. Um, that has been the main thing, but we were able to solve them and we were able to do that through collaboration between the different teams. And um, just sort of to go a bit into to the, the next um, questions, of if I wanted, if there's something I wished someone would have told me, um, so um, myself and Risha came up with this um, matrix of how to troubleshoot something as complex as a service mesh when your own application is very complex. And I just wish that I had access of that when I was deploying it. Um, but yeah, that, that has been the biggest challenge, I would say. Um, and in terms of a surprising benefit, um, being able to see on the UI to see the dependency tree between services because although we're a very, very small team, we move very fast. And um, sometimes it's, it's hard for the systems engineers to keep up with how the dependency between the services um, has changed over even on a weekly basis. And also that helps with um, onboarding new engineers as well. Okay, great. And that decision matrix that you and Risha 
came up with. That's in your talk, which is linked yeah. to. So there's a link to that at the end. Okay, we're going to do one last question here from me, and we're going to have to stay really focused because I want to leave a bunch of time for the audience Q and A. We've got a whole bunch there. Um, so very last question, 30 seconds or less. Maybe you've already answered this, Anna, but we can start with you. What What's your best advice for other organizations who want to adopt a service mesh? Is it watch Watch your service mesh con talk? <laughs> um, I would just say, don't be afraid to reach out to the to the team who's uh, uh, who's managing your uh, who's um, yeah managing your service mesh. No, sorry, uh, contributing, maintaining. That's the word. Uh, maintaining uh, the service mesh. Um, so for us, uh, we are able to contact you guys over Slack, and that was the fastest way we were able to fix everything that we're seeing on our side. Um, and don't be intimidated because it looks uh, it's very complex. The service mesh is very complex. Um, so just take everything incrementally and add things as you go. That's it. Uh, that's great. Okay. William, what about you? What's your best advice? 30 um, I'd, say, I'd say for adopting a service mesh, uh, the incremental approach um, is the best uh, way to look at it. Uh, I would take it a step further and say, while you're looking to adopt it and take an incremental approach, uh, get something working. And then when you get something working at a very small level, break it see how it breaks, understand how to be able to triage it, roll back the break, go and add the next uh, piece of the feature, and try and take things in a functional unit. So let's say north-south for an API gateway, take that as one unit. Fit for east-west between services and na uh, namespaces, another unit uh, between multi-clusters as its own separate unit. You'll learn a lot about the subtleties and the insides of the abstractions by seeing how it breaks and then putting it back together. Great. Right. All right, and Matt, I saw you nodding your head. Is that uh, uh, resonate with you? Yeah, I think it's safe to say that if you're if you're dabbling in these waters with service meshes, everything is shiny. Uh, so be really, really, really clear about what you actually, what problems you're trying to solve, and ruthlessly prioritize. There are many features of Linkerd, for example, we haven't explored yet because we've really needed to focus on uh, the ones we focused on. Uh, and take an incremental approach and, and iterate. Um, as an example, you know, we have at, the, at this point some namespaces where we've got everything in the namespace is meshed. In our new environments we're building out for our next, next generation stuff, it'll be a default to have the service mesh enabled and, and the exception will be when you're not on it. But um, it's very easy to roll out something very broadly and then, and then discover what you don't know. So. And right. also, I'll, I'll plus one, reach out to the upstream communities. Um, that's one of the advantages of working in open source uh, based CNCF stack. Great. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the community aspect is coming out here. Um, okay. So we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, while we've all been talking, Ariel has been slaving away behind the scenes, curating all the questions that have come in. Um, so I have no idea what these questions are. I have not looked at them yet. We're going we're gonna to find out together. Taking a quick, quick, quick pass through. There's some good questions here. Well, how about this? We've got, uh, let's see. Ah, okay, four questions total. And let's make it a free for all. So rather than me directing everything, I'll sure. pick a question uh, to answer and. Yeah, so what's, I think somebody asked, uh, why did you move to, uh, to Linkerd from Istio or Istio versus there's two or three questions on that. Uh, for us, we rolled out Istio first. We still have one workload on it because it uses uh, header-based dynamic path routing, which Linkerd doesn't do. Uh, we kind of found that Istio was very broad. It, it seems to have a ton of features, um, but it's also very difficult and it has a lot of moving parts. Uh, and for us, most importantly, it's very opinionated on ingress gateway. Uh, and we wanted to have the flexibility to choose our own ingresses as we still haven't consolidated on one single API gateway uh, type like ambassador or glue or something else. Uh, so for us, Linkerd was a little more narrowly focused uh, and more um, towards a, a less configuration and less barrier to entry, uh, as well as being a little bit um, less overhead in terms of performance. So when we moved to Linkerd, it was primarily, like I said, for those three things, observability, MTLS, and load balancing. And it left open choices later uh, that we didn't have to make up front. I would just add on what Matt said. 
we've had the same experience with Istio and Linkerd, where we found that Istio was uh, was having a lot more features, but it's also the barrier to entry is much more higher. Um, and Linkerd is much more simpler, but for us specifically, it came down to being able to to deploy it. And at the time when we did it, we didn't have the right support from Istio to be able to troubleshoot it properly. Of course, that doesn't mean that things haven't changed for them now, but that's just what our experience has been. I say uh, ours kind of echoes. So we deployed Istio initially uh, because it was basically 30 minutes and it's up and ready and services are deploying into it. Uh, but we actually ran into troubles upgrading between versions and trying to resolve uh, features. Uh, Linkerd was always looked at as, you, here are the components in the Lego bricks, put them together how you need them and how you want. Uh, Istio is more of push one button and fingers crossed it works exactly as you need it. Uh, it was very opinionated as the API gateway. Um, we actually ran into issues, and the reason we migrated, or the start of the migration from uh, Istio to Linkerd, was when Helm options and uh, Istio CTL options were not being respected. And you dive into code and you realize, okay, there's a significant difference between the two, and there's no, there's no way to configure at a particular uh, construction. Whereas Linkerd, two hours later, was up and running with the full cluster in a beta environment, and we didn't really look back. No, that's great. Uh, I see there's a question around latency and overhead and metrics. Um, there are uh, there are some metrics if you search for Kinvolk, K-I-N-V-O-L-K, and Linkerd, maybe Kinvolk, Linkerd, Istio, you'll see a performance comparison that was done in May of last year, so it's almost a year old, and both projects have you know, released several versions since, um, but that was uh, the most uh, comprehensive benchmarks and uh, that, that I'm aware of, and all that stuff is downloadable, and so you can, you can uh, reproduce those uh, graphs yourself, um, or not, uh, try, try it with a new version, and let's see what happens. Uh, and then there's a question about the underlying proxy service. Does that have the greatest impact on performance and latency? Or is it the policy-driven parts of the mesh that cause the greatest resource contention and latency? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think either, either of those could have, uh, certainly the proxy has a huge impact on, on performance, uh, you know, because that's the thing where every single call you're making between services now has to go between not just one, but two proxies. I mean, A talks to B and they have a proxy uh, kind of on uh, both at the client side and at the service side. So if that proxy is not as fast as humanly possible, as com computationally possible, um, then then you're losing on, on performance. On the policy side, you know, I guess it depends on how policy is done. So it's, it's easy for Linkerd because Linkerd doesn't have policy right now. So there's no performance hit. <laughs> um, uh, it's on the roadmap for Linkerd. And when we, do, when we do that, you know, it'll be done in a way that doesn't have resource contention. Um, what about this I one? Fire some of the rest of these. There's three minutes. It looks like um, I was just reading through. I could give some quick answers, but yeah. yeah. Let's okay. Do um, uh, one of them was canaries and blue greens uh, with Linkerd. Uh, that's something we're piloting now using something called Flagger, uh, which is out of Weaveworks. It, it integrates pretty nicely, uh, and you know uh, I hope to have some better results to talk about soon. But our our pilots are looking great so far. Uh, on the uh, ingress side, we're using Nginx today. Uh, and the reasoning why, I, I can't remember who asked that question, but um, the reasons why is we're, we're operating clusters in multiple clouds. And so we want our application definitions to be as portable as possible. Uh, so not having to tokenize things like ingress decorations uh, for you know this cloud vendor versus that cloud vendor's ingress um, is, is something that drove us. Uh, also, Nginx is like 20 years old. And, established. Um, so for us, that was a safe choice. We're also using NGNX for ingress. Um, we've always done so, so it wasn't a map. It wasn't anything related to Linkerd. Um, it was good to see that they work together, though. There's a question on multi-tenancy as well. Oh, I'm sorry, William. I was going to say, we're on the Envoy side, and that was more from a performance and uh, rapid uh, reconfiguration. 
Uh, we also got an advantage on the uh, gRPC to REST transcode because we were greenfielding and proto buff and gRPC from the beginning. We didn't have to swagger, define, and uh, swagger spec all the REST side. Yeah, we have a couple of services using gRPC gateway for that. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so we're, you know, gRPC under the covers and then can expose REST. There was a question about multi tenancy and service mesh. Um, I can only speak to Linkerd right now, but you can run multiple versions of the mesh in different tenants if you wanted to. Uh, however, because CRDs, at least for the near future until version CRDs are more real, uh, it's you're stuck with one version of the mesh across a particular cluster. Uh, but you can run multiple control planes in parallel without too much drama. Um, there were a couple of questions about upgrades. How do you folks handle upgrading the mesh? Um, so. When we um, when we installed Linkerd, the the Helm chart for Linkerd wasn't wasn't that advanced, so we decided to just create this, an in-house script. Uh, the plan was always to to get the Helm chart um, with Linkerd, but we just haven't had time to do that. But uh, we just do it via script, and uh, there's there isn't really downtime, or if there is, maybe a couple of minutes max. So we haven't seen much downtime. And in terms of, I think the question was specifically about Terraform and infrastructure. Um, we haven't, we also deploy our infrastructure with Terraform and we haven't seen any issues with that. Yep. And those Helm charts have been updated a fair amount in, in 2.7. Yeah, we're, we're in the same place. We initially installed just manually by hand because the, the Helm charts didn't exist at all. Um, we're using Terraform for infrastructure, so the cluster itself is Terraformed, but workloads themselves we don't have in Terraform. Um, one approach that we've found that works pretty well so far for having uh, GitOps methodologies, but with Helm as well, uh, is to use Flux CD. Uh, however, we're using a mixture, and so we're, we're looking at the Helm operator, but we've actually, um, Flux has some capacity to template things out. So the approach we're probably going to be taking for upgrading moving forward uh, is to template out the Helm chart and then apply that directly. Um, I don't think we have time to cover how upgrades with Linkerd work anyway. It's probably out of scope, but um, we've shown that we can do it without taking real downtime. Yeah, we, we, approach from, uh, yes. we, <laughs> we approach it at the cluster level. We pick the cluster out of rotation from more like a Kubernetes Federation perspective uh, and update from that. Uh, we joined, uh, started using Linkerd after the Helm charts were solid. So <laughs> that was that was one of the hurdles that we wanted to see overcome before we started trying it out. Nice. Uh, and yes, and with that, uh, this very lively uh, conversation comes to an end. Thank you so much to the Williams, Ana Maria, and Matt uh, for today's great presentation. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the slides and the recording of this will be available later today. Uh, if you have additional questions and we didn't get to all of them, uh, slack.linkerd.io, which was one of the early questions, is a place where you can go and engage with the community. Uh, Thank you all so much, and we hope to see you at a future CNCF webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, William. Thanks, Anna. Thank you.